I'm Stephen Foskett, and this is Tech Field Day. The video you're about to see brings together a panel of a dozen delegates from around the world who focus on enterprise technology to talk and learn about new technology products from companies like DriveScale. If you'd like to learn more about this, you can go to techfieldday.com. And if you like this video, you can see a lot more at youtube.com slash techfieldday. I'm uh, Chris Lunkel. I'm a distinguished engineer, and I get to On this slide, I get to show you some of what we built. So what I'd like to show you um, is sort of building up from, from the bottom of what Tom said. So Tom said at the bottom of these things, there's a bunch of, of resources. Um, so you know we have a, a rack, a, a demonstration rack that's got just enough to show these things. So we have a, a rack in there. And you can sort of see at the bottom our, our inventory of what, uh, what the system sees in there. And some of these things you're familiar with, and some of them, uh, you know, maybe the first time you've managed them in the data structure. So uh, about uh, 30 feet uh, to my left over there, there's a half rack full of equipment. And we've got uh, eight servers that we've installed our server agent on. And so those are inventoried there. And the server agent is responsible both for inventorying what the, uh, you know, what the server is about, how much memory it has, what network connectivity it has, and also for executing configuration instructions that we see. Uh, we've got uh, one JBOD in there, and it's got 60 drives in it. Um, so that's actually a little bit, a uh, little bit less than this JBOD is capable of. This JBOD uh, currently has 16 empty slots in it. So that's the kind of density that you can expect from JBODs: 76 disks and four rack units. Um, and we've got a switch, and we inventory the switch because, as Tom said, we're aware of the switch topology, and this is how we ensure that your disk traffic stays within a rack where bandwidth is cheap, where the, where the servers perform well. Uh, we've got one rack unit of our hardware in this demo config. It shows in this thing as the four drive scale adapters. So the inventory is the independent heads that they are. And we have a single management server. So this is a demonstration configuration as opposed to a production configuration, which would probably have three triple redundant uh, management servers. So I can look at some of the details of these things. Um, so for instance, uh, you know, here's the list of servers we have. We could also take a look at one of the things that might be new to a lot of customers in their, in their data center, a JBOD. For a lot of our prospective customers, this is the first time they're deploying a JBOD. So having a tool in there that gives you basic inventory of that one uh, is a handy thing to have. So this JBOD has, well, has a bunch of drives in it. Um, and then it all, we also show the port expander. And so this is showing what our system can see about the storage topology. So since the JBOD is attached to our adapter over SAS, we can inventory that. We can find the exact connectivity, which paths are shared, where there's bandwidth, uh, you know, where, where, failure would, where failure would impact us, um, in addition to which of these drives are in this JBOD. So that if I were to need to go replace one of these drives, I would be able to tell you which slot it was in, so which when you pull out the JBOD, you can figure out which, uh, you know, what to, which of these, uh, which of these things to push the button on and pull and replace. Just to be clear, is this, yeah. are we accessing this here on the management nodes or is this through your cloud portal? This is, so everything I will show you is from the management uh, interface on a local on the box. So this is running from the management server. Um, yeah, we won't, uh, we won't show the cloud portal today. Um, so I can also take a look at uh, one of these drives and the details uh, that are available for it. So this is you know, a drive, and it's, it's uh, one of those drives in the JBOD. Um, I can go back. And uh, so take a look at one of our adapters and, and what, it's, what we've got to say about its detail. Um, so we have one drive skill adapter. They say there's four, four units in there. And likewise, it, uh, you know, we report the network connectivity of it. So we know about each of its inter Ethernet interfaces and which switch they're connected to. So if you look in here, we can tell you that uh, the, two port the two Ethernet ports on this uh, adapter are connected to the same switch. And if I go to one of the servers, it would also say that those two ports are connected to the same switch. And from that, we infer the connectivity, the bandwidth, what we call a bandwidth domain. So when it is a good idea to attach a drive. And in practice, this means they're in the same rack and connected to the same top of rack switch, where like Tom says, bandwidth is abundant. There's more than enough bandwidth that's one of those top of rack switches to take a complete server worth of disks, put it at the bottom of the rack. And this is how we know. So once you've turned on LDP, we connect all of this, we collect all of this information automatically. And so that means it's available for our software to do smart things when the user asks for sort of simple things in the configuration. So for the drives, are you able to handle 
firmware updates and all that from this management platform? Not, not yet. We have the low-level mechanism in place, but not all the high-level delivering the image yeah. transparently. So we, we've 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 done we've certainly done it from the adapter. There is not management plumbing in there. Okay. So the adapter, of course, runs Linux, and we can run the standard tools that will execute those firmware updates. Um, it's not included yet as a feature of the product. And are there any issues with mixing various makes, models, uh, SSDs, this? Um, so at the moment we're, we're mostly focused on spinning media, um, but largely no, as long as it plays nicely on the SAS bus uh, and we can inventory it, uh, we, can, have, we can serve it. I have some of the oldest, grotiest uh, SAS drives, you know, 15 year old things from eBay. <laughs> yeah. they, they work fine. It, it, it's really a matter of what does the JBOD vendor qualify in terms of heat is the usual. So no IDE support. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so our, our reference configuration, all these ones, we're showing SAS drives. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, we, we like the dual portedness for re its redundancy. Yeah. You can uh, use like SATA, but with an a interposer to make it SAS. Yeah. Okay, so uh, with the inventory, I'd like to show sort of forming it up into a cluster and how we go about doing that. So if I sort of told you these are the pieces, the consumables, if you will, are these two things. They're servers and, and drives. And um, so what I'd like to do is show you how you can go build that up. So how we think about forming a pile of CPUs and a pile of disks into what the application above us is expecting. In the case of Hadoop, it's a server with a bunch of directories, each of which on a different disk that it can store its data blocks in. And so the way we think about the components inside what we think of as a cluster, which is a group of servers that are going to be used to, to some purpose. So we have the notion of a logical cluster that you might think of as a little different than a cluster, meaning your six racks. So a, a cluster is something that's going to run some application. And so what do I as a user need out of a cluster and how do I get DriveScale to configure that for me? And the way we think of it is these templates for a node. So a node is a combination of a server and the number of disks that you would like. And so what we start off is by making some things, a template that describes what we would like out of, out of a node. So I can make a new template inside our management server, and maybe I'll call it TFD12 data node. And OK, so what do I want in a server? Um, well, I guess maybe at the moment I'm not too, I don't care too much about what, how many CPUs it has. So the kinds of things that we can say are, we can say it needs to have at least 12 cores or at least 36 cores. We can see it need, say it needs to have some amount of memory. So I'd like mine to have 64 gigabytes of memory. And okay, so the, you know, so the biggest variable in this related to drive scale is how many disks do I want on this node? So I told you that uh, there's 60 back there. So I probably shouldn't ask for 80 drives on a node because there's not enough hardware for it. Um, but one of the things we're seeing a lot of customers is that there are a lot of customers who are saying that their traditional 12 disk 2U server has, depending on how you think of it, either not enough CPU or too many disks. I guess those are two ways of phrasing the same thing. So instead of configuring a cluster with the normal 12, I'll pick eight. What happens if you pick more drives than what are available? I was just um, that. Sure. So um, at some point, it will tell you that it is not able to execute your configuration request. Mm -hmm. um, so it, at the top of it, and I'm sure it's a little bit of an eye chart here, um, it's telling you how many things match. Now, on one use server, there can, there can be other ways. Maybe you know, they're not usable together. But the top of this thing, if I were to type 80 drives into it, um, it says zero available of zero total matching 80 drive groups. It's okay. telling me that you know, there's not enough there. And if I were actually to go through and try to make a cluster out of this, it would produce an error message that says something on the order of, um, I made as many nodes as I could. It was zero. I ran out you know, trying to produce the first node of, of 80 drives. So the same thing would happen if you, already had, if you already had one of these templates and you've already configured all the maximum drives that you have available. Yes. Okay. yes. So when you go to make a cluster, uh, which we'll do in a moment, it's going to look at the pool of available resources. Because I have eight servers and 60 drives and no configured cluster because I cleaned things out for this demo. That's what I've got. Okay. But for these things, I can, we can show you that at the end or, or offline. Yeah. So if you've got multiple clusters, 
Yeah. Um, what kind of levels of security do you have for segregating those clusters? So the, the management software basically makes sure that every server can only see the drives that are provisioned to it. So if you're administrator of DriveScale, you're in control of all of this at the moment. Um, so you can make any drive show up anywhere. But between the management server and the server and the adapters, we're con in con full control of all that connectivity. So if you are a server or someone random and you go to one of the adapters and you ask for one of the drives, it's going to give you a permission denied error, right? It's going to give you an iSCSI can't log in error. Mm -hmm. And so all of the, the, the part we're responsible for, the, the data security, the login credentials for that are securely transmitted to the server so that only the servers that are configured for the drives are aware of them in any way. Okay. So, uh, so do you isolate the traffic, the iSCSI traffic, like in a separate VLAN from so, the um, between the controller and the server? So I think that's largely, we don't, we don't have to. Um, and we, we don't provide support for having, for having the adapter be in different D VLANs at the moment. But it's certainly a roadmap feature. So there are some of our customers who, particularly, who are potential um, service providers. And so they themselves are providing a bunch of Hadoop um, clusters to their, you know, to their customer. So the, you, you, know, you, you want to call them up and they say, I'd like a Hadoop cluster. And they would give you one that's isolated. And so I think a roadmap feature for this is for the adapter to be VLAN tag aware support so that you can make it configure the switch so that each of the each of the our customers' customers has a different VLAN and that we've isolated those traffic. But those are roadmap features. Um, but if you want to isolate the traffic on there, as long as it gets from the server to the to the adapter, I'm good with it. Well, that's all done through iSCSI's. Security, like through chap or yeah. So the authentic the authentication and we don't see and you don't any. see any of it all. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's hard to show you not seeing something. Unfortunately, <laughs> it's hard, hard to demo That's that. That's great. You're showing it great. I also know. Yeah, um, actually, the the management server generates different keys for each possible server disk pair. Yeah, and so it's it's very secure from connection point of view. Okay, so let's, uh, let's save this newly created uh, template. Oop, let's not save that one because it had 80 drives in it. <laughs> it's, uh... Okay, yeah, let's go back to eight. Eight, I said. Okay, and uh, so with that in mind, with having created one, we have some already existing in there. And so I'll just reuse... Uh, a name node technique for the other kind of, of thing, the other kind of ingredient. And so the way I think of these things is uh, a cluster is a, is a recipe, and these node templates are the ingredients. So I just defined barley flour or something like that. So now I can make a, a recipe. And so I'm going to make a new template for a cluster. So this is <laughs> a bunch of servers of potentially different configurations. And I'll call it TFD. And we'll uh, add some ingredients to it. So here are, the, here are the logical node clusters that are available to me. And uh, yeah, I'll have some of that uh, TFD12 data node. And maybe I'll use some of that name node too. Uh, name nodes are good in, uh, in Hadoop clusters. Um, and what's telling us in this one is that uh, the name node only uses one disk. So you don't need a lot of storage on a, on a name node. Okay. And okay, so a recipe involves ingredients, but also sometimes amounts of things. It can be important whether you put in a, a tablespoon of salt or a you know, fine pound bag of it. Um, and so I can look inside these cluster templates. And so for the data node, yeah, I'll take as many of these as the cluster is specified, but a name node, it's one of those in a cluster. So I'll go to the name node and say, well, I do need to have at least one name node and I need to have no more than one. And so what this provides is a template for a cluster. And so this is basically a bunch of recipes for creating Hadoop templates of potentially varying size. So any Hadoop cluster I made with HDFS is going to have one name node and some number of data nodes. And other than that, it's just including those sort of recipe, the ingredients that I defined. And so I'll save that. And we will go make ourselves a cluster. And I'll call my cluster TFD. And I want it to have, I guess I'll seven, seven nodes, not 17. And I will use our newly created TFD cluster. And so when I click the button, all the smarts are going to happen. 
<coughs> and so this is all the intelligence about which drive I should use, which server I should use, and which server I should connect to which drive. All happens in that period of time uh, between when I click the button and have asked for a server, uh, asked for a cluster with uh, seven nodes, and when it has proposed something to me. And so this basically is, it went off, it searched for some servers, for some drives, it was pretty straightforward because there's only one rack. Um, but it, it caught up these ones and it's asking me to approve them. And so it says, well, I'm going to use just one name node with a server and one drive. And I can click the red button. And it is going to go. And it is going to tell the adapters that they should serve iSCSI. It is going to tell the servers that they should consume the iSCSI. It is going to tell the servers to tell the multipath that it should use all of the adapters if they are available. It will tell the servers which order they should be used in that will make the performance, make everything perform correctly. And it all does that. It does that all in a few seconds. And so what you get, we can take a look at uh, now what we got out of a cluster. So we got, uh, we have this one TFD cluster. And what it has in it is seven logical nodes, um, six data nodes, and one name node. And we can take a look at what's inside one of those. And these are the disks that it's chosen. So uh, what you see in here is at the bottom of this one, we can provide you either mounted file systems or a block device. Um, so for HDFS in the end, it's most convenient for us to mount the file system on a place that, uh, that HDFS is going to want to use it. But if you'd like to consume a block device, uh, we create a link in something that just identifies the, the drive. So you get a link in a dependable place that uh, is a simple identifier of that bare drive, because that's our unit of allocation and how we think about drives. Um, and you could at this point go to the server and DD <coughs> off of Deb's drive scale, IQN dot so on and so forth. Um, and it would be configured that way. So that's, um, you know, that's the, you know, building up these pieces into a, a logical cluster configuration. Can you open the composer section again real quick? Yeah. Can I just paraphrase what you just did to make sure I'm understanding correctly? Certainly. So the, the node template, you're finding <coughs> basically a pool of resources to pull from. And then on the cluster template, you're defining a way to pull from those resources. Yeah. So and then the cluster is an instantiation of that. Yeah, exactly. So it's a, it's a template and template. So a node <coughs> template is, I mean, it's what you would think. If you were buying physical hardware, it would describe the SKU you were buying, <coughs> right? It's got a certain number of server, a certain number of, of CPU. It's got some drives. In the physical world, that would have corresponded to some part number from Dell configured in some particular fashion. And so what this one is just saying, okay, yeah, it's a thing with 64 drives, that one. Okay, so that's a SKU. The logical, so that's a, a, a template, no, no, node no. template. So a cluster template is a collection of node templates and some restrictions on how many I want. Got it. Right. Okay. The nodes need not be the same. Yeah. Like you could have different types of nodes within a cluster. Yeah. So that sort of maybe would conform, it would be like the reference configuration for, um, you know, for Hadoop in one of these things, right? So that, you know, if I'm going to go configure a rack for Hadoop, in the traditional world, I would have bought some different piece of hardware, some different SKU to serve as the name node because I wanted to stuff it with more memory and I didn't want to put any drives in it. And so what that corresponds to in our world is the particular things you need out of a place you can install software. Um, but then I've got numbers of them. So yeah, it's a, it's a template for a template, if you will, sometimes. And, and the other piece is when, when you have multiple racks, we have the intelligence to know that you shouldn't cram the entire cluster into one rack. You, you really want to spread it out for failure avoidance. So a question about, uh, so you got all these templates yep. and the ultimate object who creates a cluster. Uh, is there some API mechanisms that can ah. be called? Uh, either externally or outside of the UI to make that happen? Yeah, excellent. It's an excellent question. So everything that you can do through the UI, there is a RESTful API. Um, and I could show you the documentation for it by you know, typing something in there. And the way I know it can do everything is actually the, the GUI is built on top of it. So we're, <laughs> we're, we're the first customer for that one. And that's how we know there's not something missing from it. We know it's not, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's designed the way we want it. We're its first customer. Um, and yeah, that's the, you know, because both because that's, it's good for that point of view and also because it's a good way to build a web UI is to build a, you know, well-defined RESTful API and then, you know, build something in front of it. 
and uh, yeah, so everything. And, and we expect that um, you know, a lot of our customers, in the end, that's what they're going to use. I mean, the, the GUI is fantastic for demos. It's fantastic for investigations. Um, it's good to learn what the system does. It's good for one-off tasks. Um, it's a conduit in the future for us to express the intelligence that we have, so for us to show you things. But, um, you know, if you're one of these customers and you need <coughs> something to automatically get a cluster, we expect that there's going to be some RESTful API plumbing their management interface and the thing they use to sell to customers back through so that when the customer buys something, this stuff all gets managed. And this is, you know. And, and we have a few simple scripts already, like... You know, give me all the IP addresses in this cluster so I can feed them to Cloud Error Manager and have it do its thing. And, and also, if the, the market we are after is, is a scale-out market in which there are hundreds of these servers. Okay, and and to be able to manage them all at a logical level is, is actually very, very important. And so that's one of the things that we, we provide here. Yeah. 